The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. about what God is doing. I'm, I'm basically calling this the, the highway of holiness, but I'm, I'm looking at a, a, a pattern. God does things according to a pattern based on principles. And so uh, he can do it any way he wants to. But here's the beginning of the process that I see. I see that there was a hunger that started in Jason, that started in me. And by the way, this is these levels of, of what God is doing with the spirit of holiness and cleansing are levels of maturity. You can't lay hands on people and make them mature. Right? There's no such thing. Maturity is basically a hungering after God, the first step. And when I saw Jason hunger, and it was like he was sick physically and said, I don't care. I just want you. I want more God. That kind of an attitude, not that you want to be sick, but that kind of an attitude in the midst of to want God more than anything else, that sets the, the criteria. And here's what I'm seeing take place in a general sense for the church. Hunger needs to be to the point of desperation. Not just a, a little hunger like uh, in between meal snack, but a hunger for God that is a pursuit. You know, it says, uh, they will seek me and find me when they what? Search for me with all of their heart. There has to be a, a, a level of desperation or that hunger that borders on desperation for God to really respond. This is what he's looking for. He's looking for your heart. And he wants to see just how hungry are you uh, and to what degree. But desperate is not a casual walk in the park. Desperate means a, a, a pursuit with great diligence and great focus. I want more. And so what I saw, and it reminded me of uh, Charles Finney, after winning a million people to the Lord, he was not satisfied with his own spiritual condition. So this is not for bad people, this is for people who hunger for more. And he was not satisfied with the condition of his converts either. Now the, the theologians all have different opinions on on what transpired. I don't care what they call it. I want more of God and, and to enter into a greater level of maturity. And here's what I saw happen in this church. First it was the hunger, and then it was a dissatisfaction with your own walk. I was dissatisfied with where I'm at. I'm dissatisfied with where the church is at. We've taught forgiveness for 40 years and there's still a large percentage of church doesn't even know how to properly forgive. And that's actually the baby step. Little children, your sins are forgiven. I mean, at that stage too, most of your Christianity is still about me, myself, and I. And in blessings, and how does it all work in my behalf? And that's part of us that will be with us forever, because God does care for us like children. But you don't want to stay children forever. It's, it's cute when you see a little baby blow bubbles but if that's an adult, it's not so cute, right? <laughs> okay, you get the drift, all right? So it can be good, but at the same time, we want God's best for all of us. We want maturity, and Full Stature Ministries was named that our calling was not evangelistic in the sense of winning the lost. Ours was evangelistic in winning Christians over to pursue a greater measure of God in their life because the church needs to grow up before they go up. And we desperately need to come to that place. I saw that basically God gave us how-tos in the first level. The first level was reconciling. The minist you know, you're all called to the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling with God and man. Step number one. This is for self, this is for just to let the Holy Spirit search your heart. You believe you have a great relationship with God. The way you relate to God is the way you relate to people. The way you relate to people is the way you relate to God. And don't tell me it's different. Don't tell me you love God, you just have difficulty with people. 
all right? Because that's not going to float, <laughs> all right? So look at your relationship, basically. There's going to have to be a deeper, richer intimacy with God and relationship with people. Look how many people believe they've got this wonderful relationship with God, don't even go to any church. But they believe they've got a wonderful relationship with God. That's actually deception. And that's going to, the spirit of holiness is going to show you that basically you're, you love God and love one another. And you, you're not doing it detached. Separation is a definition of sin. To be separate is sin. Separation from God. Separation from God's people. Would that not be the same thing? I love God. It's just these people I can't stand. That's not going to hold up, is it? And the spirit of holiness is going to deal, I believe, primarily with our attitude toward people. So hunger goes to desperation. Desperation led to a breakthrough. And I saw the breakthrough in many of you. And when, I, when people ask me, but they go, does this grow? Yes, it's progressive. There is a work that is done, but then there is a progressive walking it out. It's forward and upward. If you want to know his will, you do the last thing he told you to do, and you shall know. Revelation. That's the stuff that I saw happen. I was blown out of the water. I've been in ministry 42 years. I'm seeing scriptures come alive that I've taught on before. And the interesting thing is, is I look back on what I taught, and it didn't negate the teaching, but I brought it to a higher level. It's actually harder. I thought the child, the young man and the father, I actually thought I had reached the fatherhood. With this last move of God, I think I'm an adolescent now. So I've got a long ways to go. It's all a matter of perspective and revelation. It's like, oh my goodness, I finally came out of babyhood into adolescence. But that's a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing. We need to humble ourselves and say that, that we're not reaching our maximum potential in God and we're too easily satisfied with the status quo. It's time to, to move on into a place of desperation. But desperation brings breakthrough, and I saw the breakthrough. That was the, the third element that I saw. And after the breakthrough, this is what's consistent with everyone that I've talked to in the congregation. After the breakthrough, there was revelation. It's like a, a, an Ephesians 5 experience. Awake, awake, you who sleep. Come out of a slumber that you didn't even know you were in. You do things when you're asleep that you wouldn't do if you were awake. Huh? You've dreamt things that you wouldn't do if you were awake. I believe that when God awakens the spirit and he hovers over it, and, and, and really spoke to me out of Jeremiah 1 where he says, he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see an almond tree, which is a, a waking tree. And he says, you've seen well, because I'm about to awaken my word to perform it. And all of a sudden, I'm getting scriptures that were just filled with revelation. And right now, where the frustration is, if there, you want to call it frustration, it's a holy desperation, is right now with all of the revelation that's on the inside, it's a clearer picture of my Jesus on the inside, filling head to toe. At the same time, it's, oh, but God, we want it for people. And I still don't know how to do that. So maybe you ought to hunger and thirst too, <laughs> right? Because it's not something you can do to somebody. All you can do is create a desire for them to hunger and, and, and be desperate for more. But with the process comes revelation. And the revelation of the scriptures basically is showing me <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that it's literally been a, an awakening. It's awakened a slumbering spirit that you didn't even know was slumbering. And in the process of it, it's like, why didn't I see this before? Is that a sign of revelation? Why didn't I see this before? And how come I didn't see it before? I don't know. But I can see it better now than I've ever seen it before. Now, in the midst of this revelation, here's the next step. After revelation should come authority, power, and glory. Are we going to press into that and believe for that? First, he's going to fill a cup that's clean. And that's important. So I want to share a little bit. I, I basically just call this the highway of holiness because I believe that that's the, that's the interesting thing about this whole thing is he's starting with that. And, <clears throat> and when <clears throat> in Isaiah 40, 
It said, there was a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley exalted, mountain and hill brought low, crooked places made straight, the rough places made smooth. And it says, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. First I believe it in my heart and stay open to the manifestation of it. I'm receiving that now, that God is making a way. And interesting, <clears throat> one of the first things that he said, <laughs> thank you, sweetie. <clears throat> one of the first things that he's changed is words, simple words that I don't know if we get lazy or if we just don't see it, but words like love, light, life, it's not a thing. Faith, it's not a thing. It's Him. He is light. He is life. He is the way. Not a way. He is the way. And <clears throat> what He was showing, even in, even in that scripture, uh, John the Baptist, prepare, uh, He was like a voice crying in the wilderness. Why the wilderness? Because I actually believe that for John the Baptist to bring the message of the Messiah, to bring personal holiness into it and a spirit of repentance, he didn't go to the temple. He operated in the wilderness. And it was like there's a new way now. And it's going to offend, in many cases, the established way. Do you believe that can happen? Do you believe a move of God could actually offend an established way? Sometimes the previous move, move of God, is the enemy to the new move. Well, I'm believing for something different. I'm believing that the only ones going to get offended are the religious people. And God loves them. We're just going to get them all saved, <laughs> right? <laughs> and free from that religious spirit. But in reality, I believe there's going to be a, a season of convergence to where many of the things that God had done formerly, He's going to rekindle them, but add the new. Add the new. It's going to be like a householder who brings forth treasures, both things that were old as well as things that are new, the fresh as well as the familiar. So let's look for that convergence, to see things where God has touched our lives in the past, a little dab here and a little dab there, and all of a sudden watch how God brings a convergence, and it becomes a powerful highway, a highway of holiness, and it's going to be the way of God. And, and, and it's going to be not just water to the ankles, not water to the knees, not water to the waist, but it's going to be you're going to have to swim with it. The, 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 it's going to be God's jet stream. It's going to be the flow. It's going to be easier to flow in it than not. But there is a precursor to it all, and that is personal holiness. He's not going to do away with the subject of sin and separation. Sin is separation. So I believe that God's going to prepare us a people. And uh, <clears throat> I just, I'm just seeing that this highway of holiness is really begins at a narrow gate. And that God's going to prepare us. Do you believe the church needs an invasion of holiness? <laughs> and power? Because as the church goes, so goes society. You're not going to change society when society has evangelized the church more effectively. When awakening comes to the church, society will be performed. But there needs to be a heart attitude change. And this is what we want to pray for. There needs to be a deep hunger of heart. You've got to be dissatisfied with where you're at and not think, I'm doing really well. Never get to that point, that I'm doing well. You, when you get satisfied with the status quo, you need to be more like the Apostle Paul to where even your accomplishments you consider rubbish compared to what lies ahead. That's, that's a proper attitude. Willing for God to begin His work in us. We want change. We want revival. But we don't necessarily think that it's us. It's someone else is going to do it and then give it to us. No, it needs to begin with you individually. You need to be pressing on, willing for God to begin that work in you. Have a holy anticipation that God can and will meet our needs for more. Now, Christian leaders, if you're watching by Ustream and 
um, or you're here in our midst, uh, for leadership, it intensifies even more so. You have a responsibility as teachers. Your responsibility is to move on and pursue. You can only give to the degree that you're at yourself. You're not going to give above and beyond what you are been equipped and anointed for. Our willingness needs to be that we admit that we have need. If you want God to bless through you, He's going to bless through it to the degree that you can be poor in spirit and rich in His. We must have a new honesty about sin. If you're not a leader, let revival begin with you. You can't start with somebody else. Don't rely on the leader to do something for you that you yourself can do. You pursue God individually. Don't wait for someone else. All right? So God wants to begin with each one of us. He wants to begin with us. Brokenness is going to be key. By brokenness, I don't mean it in a bad way. Brokenness in the sense of being yielded for God to facilitate change in you. All right? It's basically a level of the cross to come into right relationship. Here's the thing that we saw. I call this six, the number of flesh. The six elements that in everyone that we saw, that we prayed for, that felt a clear, distinct change take place in their life, saw what I call the six deadly seas diminish. How many know what the six deadly seas are? Write them down. If you're watching by Ustream, you need to write it down because this is indicative of the heart attitude. I don't care how spiritually gifted you are, these things must go to cultivate the fear of the Lord and to prepare the heart in this highway of holiness. One, you covet. Two, you compete. Three, Compare, four, complain, five, conceal, six, control. When there is a clear abandonment to the Lordship of Jesus in your life, and in that pursuit, those disappear. To the degree that those six C's are operational in your life, you are still separated from God in the sense that you're doing what you want to do. He's not in control. He's not Lord. See, we're moving from Savior to Lord. What's the child know? The child knows your sins are forgiven. Everything is me, myself, and I, and what God has done for me. The young man is basically he himself in me has become my value system. Faith is not an it. Life is not an it. Love is not an it. It's him. He is the way. He is the truth. An intimate relationship with him because there's a clean cup within. He wants to overflow. But he's not going to pour into an unclean cup, is he? We need to see that we are vessels. We were designed and made by God to be vessels. But he's looking to say, you know what? I've got to come into right relationship with God. It might cost something. It might be painful. Will it be painful? Well, to your flesh. It'll cost you something. It might even be humiliating. But that proud eye has to be bent into not I, but Christ. There has to be an element of humility to where you're willingly surrendering your life. And we want to approach a hunger and thirst for God. We want to basically say, I'm offering my body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto you. Not just quote the words, but allow him to show you in the heart anything that you, are, that you cannot let go of. I still remember how you can't go by outward appearance. I had a parachurch ministry uh, many years ago that there was at least 100 couples, 200 people in total attendance. It was larger than a lot of churches, uh, larger than this church. And it was basically 
at a time when it was at its peak, God said, now I want you to release it. And I let it go. And not without a cost. You know what the cost was? Oh, Dennis, you don't understand. My husband would only, that's the only place my husband would go. And you hear, you hear, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand. That was the only place that we had real fellowship. Oh, you don't understand. That was only, but if God says, let it go, you let it go. And that's part of the cost. And I found out that after I let it go, I had four, four internationally known pastors took me out to lunch. Oh, no, three. I was a fourth. Four of us went out to lunch, and they said, it's time for you to start your church. God spoke to us. They gave me finances. They gave me everything, and I never asked for any of that. But there had to be a letting go of your ministry or anything that you're holding on to tight. Some of you got to let go of your children. Some of you brought it to the place. What I'm seeing now in a move of holiness, there is actually very easy to understand scriptures that I never paid a lot of attention to. Like, you must hate mother and father if you want to be my disciple. He doesn't want you to hate your mother and father. He says, I don't want you to have such a hold on them that you can't let them go for my purposes or my cause. Hmm? That's what he's talking about. It has to be to where there is no greater love than he himself in you, through you. But the child sees him for us. The young man sees him as us. And the mature that I'm seeing mature now is it's just others. Him working to others. A sacrificial life. It's really getting me too, the where I see that the, even the ministry in the three levels. The first level is reconciliation. We're all called to that. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. And yet we're still teaching the church how to forgive. They're bummed out. This one hurt their feelings. This one rejected them. That is, that's kindergarten. That's not even child. That's really baby stuff. You've learned how to forgive. You should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth, and it should flow out of you as natural as breathing. And it is as easy as breathing when you let the forgiver do it and quit trying to do it in your own strength. That's the problem with the child level. But the young man, the young man is basically, he should be so strong in the Lord. The Word of God abides in him. He's, he's clearly got the enemy under his feet. He walks in victory. People know that they're in victory. They recognize the victory that that individual's life, they should be spending their time on cultivating temptation, which never leaves, knowing that instead of cultivating how good they are at forgiveness, how good they are at resisting temptation. That should be the muscle that's experienced in the young man. To where not only temptation, but also in the light of him, as your Lord, you begin to see self and the things that self won't let go of that you would say are okay in and of themselves. I've seen people make idols out of education. They made idols out of their children. They made idol idols out of their husband or their wife. Good things that you wouldn't call sin, but you can make an idol out of anything. Isn't that interesting in 1 John, the, those little epistles? Love, 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 love. And at the last statement, he goes, little children, beware of idols. Because that would be where the tendency is for a lover even, all right? You would find something that you love so much you can't let go. And you elevated it to a dangerous proportion. But I'm looking at the third level for believers if God called me to full stature ministry, I'm obligated, whether anyone's interested or not. I'm obligated from the time I was saved to bring unto maturity. As a matter of fact, I used to share about how uh, a friend of mine said, after listening to 400 hours of cassette tapes of mine, he had the Institute for Biblical Literacy. He was very cerebral, IQ 177. He said, Dennis, I can sum you up in 11 words. That's after listening to 400 some hours. How would you like to be summed up in 11 words? Wouldn't you be very curious as to what those 11 words? And he says, in sequential order. Oh, so now it's even in 11 words and in sequential order of significance. <laughs> and you know what the first two words he said? How to. And that's been the story of my life since I was a baby Christian. It, uh, I've 
hungered after that. It's been developed over the years, and God's going to bring us into a new level of maturity, and then he's going to teach me some more how-tos. Then he, then he uh, prophesied that over me, didn't he? He said that what you've been proficient at at one level, I'm going to take you to another level. This is in 2007. This is happening now. And at that new level, I'm going to teach you how-tos to help the church progress along into the higher levels with God. But first, you've got to get to the higher levels or you're not, it's not going to be very appreciative. If you don't know how to forgive and you don't walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness to where it's a flow as easy as breathing, then you're not going to fall in love with a lot of the conquering techniques for temptation and repetitive temptation and glorying in your weakness and consider it pure joy. I, Jennifer told me not to do this, but I can't help it. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials that the testing of your faith produces patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a muscle. You hold your heart open and you go through faith and patience. I'm going to get the promises. I don't care if anyone else gets them or not. I'm going to get it because I can give something I don't have. And I was called to others. I saw the ministry of reconciliation is the baby stage, but lordship is the young man stage. But Reconciliation, learning that, learning to forgive, learning to cultivate that love for God and, and forgiveness toward other people and moving in the love of God, that's where the rubber meets the road. But that second step, oh, that second step is basically saying, Jesus is Lord. Everything matters, not that He's my Savior, it matters, is He Lord in every situation of my life? And teaching people how to do that. But on the other hand, not only is He Lord of my life, but I'm learning how that it's, it's we. And every time I used to say me, I got sick. Do you realize you are separating yourself from the new creation? That they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with them? Have you ever thought of that? This is what the spirit of holiness will do. It'll make you start thinking, I tried to do that by myself. I got sick. No, it came upon us. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. He's, he didn't go anywhere. It's not, He's in heaven and I'm down here sick. You see that separation? That thinking has to change. And that's the first thing that it did. It started changing, and it started changing of all things. And Jennifer says, go easy on this. So... You don't you take this with the way you want. All of the scriptures that pertain to hardship, when I see hardship in the Bible for the cause of others, that death works in me, that life would work in others, I am almost always focused on the resurrection side of it. I'm cognizant that I, like anyone else, don't like hardships. But when all of a sudden you look at the scriptures and you and it's almost like you're 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 emphasis is on the resurrection side of the hardship. That's a good way to think, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to think that way? God can make you think that way if you hunger and thirst for it. And don't fear the cross, knowing that everything that happens, happens to the both of you. So it's like what he is to me as a child, and then it becomes him for me, him in me, and I'm, how many years have we taught on Christ in you, the hope of glory, to the point where to this day we, we could go to a, a church that never heard any of our teaching and say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Point to Jesus, where is he? And they still go like that. Not here, you don't do that. Does that tell you that there's some sleepiness about his location? Yes, he's in heaven but on earth as it is in heaven. God's taken faith to a whole new dimension as well. Faith is basically a person. It's not a thing to me. Faith is Him. And it's life. Life is Him in me. Love is Him in me. And what I'm passionate about now is God, reveal to me how it is to be demonstrated. It's almost, the, with the revelation he's giving, it's almost, but I want to move to where it's others oriented. Because even these first two things, as wonderful as they are, still pertains to me. Do you understand that? 
First, it's, I surrender to me. I can be a forgiver. God is good to me. He loves me. I'm a child of God. Then it's like, I've overcome the wicked one. I can be strong in, in the Lord and overcome the wicked one. The Word of God, the living Word of God abides in me. Wonderful. I can feel a level of holiness that I never knew before. Wonderful. But there is now an ache. <laughs> and I can't do that. Only God could do that. But I'm going to believe that through faith and patience, I'm going to inherit that. You want to inherit that too? Then you've got to, patience is holding the heart open to something. You've got to hear it first. But secondly, you've got to hold the heart open to it until there's manifestation. I have an awakened spirit. I am clearly walking in revelation of the scriptures that I have not seen in decades. But I'm waiting for that part. Are you waiting for that part? Well, you go for it yourself. Don't wait for me to do it. That's the goal. Leaders, they should be doing this. But individuals, real revival starts in you. Don't wait for something to happen and then you see if you can jump on the bandwagon. Does that make sense? Those five deadly seas, a broken self bows itself to the will of God, admits that you're wrong. The only danger is if you think you're really okay. <laughs> I'm, to me, there's never enough. What we used to tell married couples, if you're wrong, husband, wife, be 100% wrong. I never saw people solve problems when, well, I might have been 90% wrong, but she was 10% wrong. That doesn't get resolved. That's just to cover up for the blame game. No, if you're going to be wrong, be 100% wrong. I had a guy, we did a marriage seminar once, and I had a guy raise his hand, and he goes, I just realized I've never been 100% wrong in my entire life. <laughs> 90, sometimes 90, but you know, it was always that other person in that other situation that if they behaved differently, it wouldn't have happened. That's called an excuse, and God can't heal that. You have to repent. All right. I told you, it, it, it's so strange, and Jennifer can bear witness to this. The five C's went away. And it's been like this for a month. And the fear of the Lord is, is something that you, you want to reciprocate. That's the only frustration right now. It's wonderful to feel clean. It's wonderful to find it very seldom that you sin. And when you do, it get, you get convicted real good. How many want to be convicted real good? Now, the trick is, when you get convicted real good, you make a choice, but you don't go into condemnation. I watch Christians who don't even have to, they don't need conviction of the Holy Spirit. They condemn themselves all the time. Right? But if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. Go to God. Quit you doing it. You're not God. Get off the throne. Do you think we need to get off the throne? King self. The Lord did it to me. All I did to get really convicted was something that I used to do without thinking. And that is I walked into the Publix grocery store and I'm walking in and I'm looking at those people that leave their carts any old place they want to. And I went, look at these people. It, how hard would that be to take the cart 20 feet back to the store? And they just leave it in the aisleway to smash against somebody else's car. Is that innocent? I got like a donkey kicked me in the gut. And the Lord spoke to me clearly and I mean clearly, it was authoritative. Who made you king of the parking lot? <laughs> hmm? You know what he showed me real quick? That we take jurisdiction, king self, takes jurisdiction in places you don't belong. You don't have a right to speak into those places. If you put your card away, that's reasonable service. You don't even get an award for that. That's just reasonable Christian service. But whether somebody else does or not, it's none of your business. I never knew King Self was so strong in my life. I thought pretty much Jesus was king. 
But I'll tell you what, with an increase of revelation, all of a sudden, you see things that were there, but you never knew they were there. Isn't that right, Jennifer? Complaining, <laughs> criticizing, controlling. Well, mine was controlling. The best sermon I ever was preached to me was in the kitchen in my own house. Jennifer never liked the way I was on the road. And she says, honey, can I say something? Right then, I'm dead. She doesn't say that without knowing you're dead now. She say, honey, can I tell you something? She said, the road, and I go, uh-oh. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. And I'm going, oh, here it comes. <laughs> and you know what? It's God's road. And those are God's people. And he places them anywhere he wants to. By that time, I was done. I was at the altar, in the kitchen, going, okay, Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but guess what? Since whatever's happened in the last four, five, six weeks, whatever it's been now, whatever's happened, the road is totally different now. 100% of the time, right, Jennifer? Six weeks of a radical change that I could not do on my own. I knew she was right when she said it, but I didn't see a change. You want that to happen in your life? Then you've got a hunger to the point of desperation because it's being made available now. I, we call it the beginning. I believe it's the beginning of the awakening, but it's the beginning that has to start in you before it's going to come on you. Everybody wants it on you <laughs> without any effort. Lay hands, impart. Now it's going to be imparted to the hungry. It can be imparted. Jennifer got it. But Jennifer's prayed for this particular thing. I kind of put it on a shelf. She's prayed for this for th almost 30 years because she started out her Christian life reading of the greats in history and coveting that intimacy that they had that was so superior that only a few had that. And she goes, I don't care. I want that. And we've only got a taste of it in the beginning, and it's radically changed my life. But it's so internal, I'm still waiting for the expression. You're awakened to life. You're coming out of that slumber. There's a new sensitivity to the spirit. Uh, you don't sin as often, but when you do, you get a good kick in the belly. You like that idea? I loved it. And I'm looking at all of those scriptures you would skip, and I'm going... I see nothing but resurrection in all of those scriptures that I would normally not get into. Resurrection. Resurrection. That's really what it's all about. And that we were called to be containers. That's all. To be containers of Him. Would you want to surrender to Him to offer your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto the Lord, which is reasonable service. You don't get crowns for reasonable service. It's just where the supernatural life really begins, and it really needs to be there. Jennifer typed up some stuff for me, and then she looked at it and she goes, whoa, that's way too hard. <laughs> so I'm skipping it, because she said it's way too hard, and she had compassion for you. <laughs> you want to hear the hard stuff? <laughs> All right, oh, let me get right to the hard stuff. Here's the part that I see. If we're going to mature, and I do believe we grow up before you go up. I'm sorry. There's a harvest coming, and you've got to have maturity for that harvest. But... Could I share at least who these people were that this was written to? Sure, come on up. What you're going to be... At what you are going to be hearing in a few minutes was written for people who were in the revival level of living. This would be um, some maybe second, second levels, but this was third level people. These were people who had entered into the, the power and the glory and the authority. These were people who were actively bringing revival wherever they went in Africa. They had brought their converts that they were not happy with where they were. They had brought them to the glory of God. They were not happy with them staying just barely saved. 
just forgiven little children. And so there was a revival going on, but there were the Christian workers, the leaders of this, and they noticed that the spirit would start to wane. And so they let God start searching their hearts because the only thing that separates God from us is sin. And they started letting God search their hearts for the smallest hint of sin in them so that they, they would be a people who lived at the revival level with the cups overflowing constantly. And this is good too on the second level, but this was written for third level people. But this is where God is taking us because what we want to do when the power hits, we want to be able to sustain it. And when we get saved, if you look at us as being like a house with walls on the outside blocking us off from people and a roof over the top blocking us from God, well, we can get saved and the roof can come off, but we still keep our walls up. To keep revival continually going, we have to have the vertical openness as well as the horizontal openness. And this is, this is good in families. It's good husband and wife. It's good uh, parents and children. And it's absolutely necessary to keep revival going in the church, which is what we're looking forward to in the awakening. Okay. I just want to give three R words, and then I want to pray for people. The way the Lord's laid it out for me in a simple way is I saw the three levels. They overcame by the blood. That's like the child. Your sins are forgiven. The word of their testimony, I saw the word of the testimony as the living word filling us head to toe. That's your value system. Jesus in me. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I live, and a lot of Darby's translation, other translations say the life I live, I live by the faith of God. It's God's faith in me. And it's God working through me. So reconciling is the ministry we've all been called to be reconciled to God and to one another. That's the forgiveness message. Reigning is basically, or ruling, is basically all the emphasis we taught for decades on lordship, not just your savior. Lordship. How to make Jesus Lord and every, everything we teach, all of our books are basically how to make Jesus Lord. How to remove any barrier between you and God to where He is clearly Lord. Not your Savior alone, but Lordship. And I saw that reconciling, the emphasis is that he saved, He's your Savior by the blood of the Lamb. But we know they overcame by the word of their testimony. And the last level is they loved not their life unto death that is so others oriented that that is reigning as priests and king. And this really hits me hard now. I know a spirit of holiness hit me, but here's the one thing I saw. How many believers do you know you would really consider a priest? Are not we called to be as believers priests and kings? A king, Jesus said, not like the world where they rule over you, but I am among you as one who serves. That's the way he saw kingship. Priests, others, totally sold out. Their reward is him. The sons of Zadok. He, Abraham, is my exceedingly great reward. Kings and priests are people walking in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus in you as king and priest and allowing him to live his life through you. You would be so others oriented. How many in the church do you know that you would really say are acting like priests? That they're so sold out to God that they're others oriented. Yet alone reigning in this life as kings in Romans 5.17. It says in the Amplified, we should reign as kings in life. But you don't reign as a king until king self is out of the way and you're subordinate to the lordship of Jesus, the king of kings. You can't reign as a king unless you're under the king. <laughs> think about that. Do you think the church has a ways to go? To be totally sold out, others, orientated, others orientation. 
death to the me, myself, and I. Even though God loves you and he's going to be good to that person. It's just that your preoccupation with it. And then thinking, I've been in the church for many years, I know a lot of Bible. Good. How much do you submit to as the living word? And in that, so it's reconciling. And how about no rule? Listen to the scriptures. So he called ten of his servants and delivered them ten minas and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We will not have this man reign over us. I wonder, I saw that scripture and I said, I wonder how many times, whether it's in the public's parking lot, I've said, I will not have that man reign over me. I am king of the road. I am king of the parking lot. Uh, huh? How many times have you said in your heart, I will not have that man Jesus reign over me? I'm going to do what I want to do. There's such an element that needs to be brought crucified. And we need to welcome a spirit of holiness to clean out that cup so God can fill us to overflowing, but he's not going to fill dirty cups. There's going to have to be a, a, a deeper level of, of desperation for cleanliness. And I, I believe already when it says Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirits like a city broken down without walls. There are people that are telling me they're in spiritual warfare when in reality <clears throat> you're giving ground to the enemy and he can run roughshod. That's not spiritual warfare. That's basically he's not ruling over your spirit. You're like a city broken down without walls. He has easy access. Then there's Proverbs 16, 32. He who's slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who can rule his spirit than he who takes a city. So you see the dangers of no rule. And you're either going to be under the law of sin and death or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's, there's no middle ground here. One is always going to rule and influence your life. Now, peace rules. We've taught this for years. The living word becomes your testimony. I overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. The peace of God rules. It surpasses all understanding. It'll guard your heart and your mind. Jesus himself is your peace. You're moving from Jesus being my Savior to Jesus being my Lord. But kings and priests is what the world needs. The world needs a fixed, steadfast, patient people who are focused on the expansion of the kingdom of God. And that won't be just lip service. You know, people say, well, the kingdom of God, when this gospel is preached to all the world, preached and demonstrated, it needs to be lived, not lip service to it, but a demonstration to where they see the church, the glorious church, to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God would be made known. God's looking for that disbursement. But here's what we're waiting for. Right now there's grace coming to us for the internal work. For what purpose is the grace coming to us for an internal work? For the expression of the glory of God. Isn't that what he wanted all along? For to bring many sons to glory, that he was the firstborn. So Father, we pray right now that you allow us to humble ourselves to be unsatisfied with the status quo of our own condition. To basically say, God, I repent of King Self in me, separating myself from you, doing what I think I need to do or what I want to do. I receive forgiveness and cleansing from that. Cleanse my cup because I want to fill the full to overflowing in Jesus' name. I receive from that cleansing and also I am asking for you to show me where self has things that can't let go of, even good things that I cannot let go of. And as you show me these things, 
I'm going to relinquish them with no strings attached. I'm going to relinquish them into your loving hands and I'm releasing them. I could see even in marriages, there's got to be a release with children. There needs to be a release. You can make it to the point of idolatry. So Father, you are a manager, not an owner. You don't own them. You're a steward. So Father, I release. Holy Spirit, show these people right now anything that they cannot let go of. I want you to slip up your hand if you can just see something that's hard to, been, always been hard to let go of. Come on, lift your hand. Humility is a good beginning. You can see something that's always been hard to let go of. So Father, right now, I release that into your hands. I'm a manager and a steward, but it all belongs to you, and I'm releasing it back to you. No matter how good I believe it is, I am not king over that. You are. And I release that to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.